A brand new location and a brand new grand designs, 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock respectively. A Wednesday night dedicated to habitation. First up, we have Jackie Long and Fatima Manji, tonight's Channel 4 News. Confidential no more. A leaked document reveals tough new government plans for immigration post-Brexit. Businesses warn it could have catastrophic consequences. Good evening. It's a highly sensitive document which we're led to believe the government had hoped to keep under wraps. But it's out in the open now, leaked to The Guardian newspaper. It's a blueprint for a tough new strategy on immigration post-Brexit. New restrictions on the number of low-skilled migrants coming from the EU and much tighter rules on family members who can join them. In the Commons today, the Prime Minister couldn't see what all the fuss was about. In essence, saying this is what people voted for in the referendum. But some businesses said it could cause chaos and it's not likely to go down any better with the rest of the EU in forthcoming negotiations. What people want to see is control of that immigration. That's, I think, what people wanted to see as a result, want to see as a result of coming out of the European Union. Also tonight, emergency evacuations are taking place as Hurricane Irma hits the Caribbean. The Category 5 hurricane is deemed potentially catastrophic and has already left a trail of devastation. The island of St. Martin is facing flooding and blackouts and roofs have been torn off even the strongest buildings. No charges will be brought against senior council figures in the Rotherham child sexual exploitation scandal. A series of reports has found widespread systematic failure was to blame. And I can't breathe, the last words of a young man who lay dying in the cage of a police van. Three police officers are at a disciplinary hearing accused of failing in their duty of care. And she's done the big box office hits with films like X-Men. Now a very different offering from Jennifer Lawrence. What were you doing in their luggage? Part domestic drama, psychological thriller and out-and-out -out horror movie. We ask her to explain what Mother is all about. That's really hard to watch. It feels like an assault. I just saw it last night. I came out like, what have we done? <laughs> it's official, sensitive and now out in the open. A draft of the government's plans for immigration from the European Union after Brexit has been leaked from the Home Office. The policies, which are still being argued about at the top of government, include quotas for low-skilled workers and telling companies they must employ resident workers unless they can show the economic need to employ an EU citizen. The document has had a frosty reception by some in Europe, although some Brexit campaigners have welcomed it. Our political editor, Gary Gibbon, reports. Theresa May has pleaded for confidentiality. Someone in Whitehall had a different idea. The leaker, it's assumed, didn't like where immigration policy post-Brexit might be going. The leaked Home Office document says from the moment of Brexit, during a transition period, there'd be immediate controls on new arrivals from the EU, blocking them from staying long if they hadn't got a job. There could be quotas for low-skilled workers, capping overall numbers. Companies wanting to recruit in the EU could be required to conduct an economic needs test to prove there aren't people in the local workforce they could recruit from. This is a draft white paper on immigration policy that Theresa May had hoped would actually have been published by now. But since her general election setback, some cabinet ministers have been pushing back on what they think is too hard line in immigration policy. They worry that it means the EU won't give Britain the transitional arrangements it wants, more or less the status quo, and that this kind of immigration policy could harm the final trade deal with the EU. The whole principle of the single market, which, lest we forget, was a British invention. It was Mrs. Thatcher who brought this in. It was based on the principle that trade isn't just about goods. It's about services, it's about capital, it's about people moving around. And you've got to treat this as a whole. And you can't just pick out one of the inconvenient bits and ignore all the others. And that's why, um, the, I mean, really the government is in a kind of fantasy world and they're not understanding the way in which the European Union has worked for decades and works today. So a hardline immigration policy post-Brexit will encourage a less generous trade deal from Europe, you think? I think there is a serious risk that that could happen. There are people, um, some of them cabinet ministers, who think 
if you go down the route of this draft document, you won't get such a good deal from Europe in trade at the end of the day. Well, I don't think they've ever been in a negotiation then if they think like that. Um, the truth is, the European Union, funnily enough, is way past where some of them may be. The European Union accepts that we're leaving. They've actually banked that already. It'll let us have any immigration policy no, we like? No, well, it doesn't. They've already assumed that we will have a migration policy which is about controlled borders. So I don't think, I've not met a European politician that says, we want you to keep freedom of movement. Their answer is, unless you sign up completely to freedom of movement, then you can't be, for those who want to be in the single market, you cannot be in the single market. So they've accepted that one of the things we're doing is putting control on our borders. Whether we put a little bit of control or a great deal of control makes no difference to them. The Prime Minister at question time defended the idea of more controls on immigration and believes that was one of the central messages of the EU referendum vote. We're already able to exercise controls in relation to those who come to this country from outside the, uh, the countries within the European Union. And we continue to believe as a government that it's important to have migra net migration at sustainable levels. We believe that to be the tens of thousands because of the impact particularly it has on people at the lower end of the income scale in depressing their wages. Some voters today sounding closer to Theresa May's view of things than her critics. Well, the control should be in place now. You know, they, they should be stopping immigration into the country. They're saying there's enough, there's enough, there's enough in the country. Deal with what you've got here first. Deal, you know, give the jobs to the British and the people that are in the country anyway. But I'm thinking, well, why are you sort of like making these youngsters from Poland and wherever coming in? Surely, if you gave our kids a decent wage, you know, would that, in, would that you know, make our kids, oh, I might go for that, I might go for that. Well, I feel that um, if they do stop all the um, low school workers, there's not going to be enough people in our area to take over those jobs because, unfortunately, the young people don't want to be vegetable pickers or be egg collectors and things like that. So I just don't think it will work. One EU minister visiting London said Theresa May would pay a heavy price for this kind of immigration policy. Does that look to you like quite a hard-line immigration policy that Britain is thinking of post-Brexit? And does it make a deal between the EU and Britain harder or easier? The document is beyond an hard line. The document is totally unhelpful. I'm reassured on the fact that it has been presented as a draft. Uh, I'm reassured with the fact that some member of your government uh, didn't even uh, read the document. So it is not... Uh, uh, to me, the official British government uh, line. But if a policy like that did come out from Britain, what would it do to the shape of the deal between Britain and Europe? That wouldn't help at all. Migration issues, which David Cameron struggled to get the EU to move on, yet again at the centre of this saga. Well, over now to Gary in Westminster. Gary, does this document suggest Britain is a long way from where the EU wants it to be in these negotiations? I think the key immediate concern in parts of government is the transition period. Ministers believe that is what will unlock progress in the wider talks. The transition period that the government is looking at is trying to get status quo in the single market and in the customs union. And as far as the European Union is concerned, that means status quo on freedom of movement. And you ask whether we're a long way from them. I think one of the lessons of the David Cameron renegotiation attempt is that you don't have to be a long way from uh, freedom of movement for the European Union to turn around and say no. If you're 80, 90 percent of the way there, they still say no. They want 100 uh, percent freedom of movement if you're having these other arrangements. Theresa May is incredibly uncomfortable with that and uh, she is very unrelaxed about the idea of getting to the point of Brexit and this transitional period and not being able to tell uh, Britons, particularly those who voted leave, that there are any new controls in place. And that uh, is about where we are at the moment and it is a very big fight inside government. Gary, thanks very much. Well, I'm joined now from Westminster by the Conservative MP Rishi Sunak and Labour's Alison McGovern. Alison McGovern, there's a lot of outrage on the left about this document, this, this plan, but surely this is exactly what the government promised or what the, what the Leave campaign promised and what people voted for in the referendum, a tough plan on immigration. 
Well, no, I think the Leave campaign was actually quite divided. Of course, people uh, in many cases were voting about immigration, but they were also told they could have 350 million quid a week for the NHS. You know, constituents of mine told me they were voting Leave to get rid of David Cameron, so I don't think it's all that clear at all. But are you, and you still have to suggesting, wonder, are you still suggesting that, that the, the government is wrong to say that this referendum was about, in part, immigration, and they have to cut immigration. I mean, surely that's Labour's problem, isn't it, in continuing well, to deny that people want immigration to be cut? No, not at all. I think that if people are worried about security and if people have got think that our economy is stacked up in the wrong way, I think they've got a point and we've got to find solutions to that. But what concerns me is this leak has been, I think, designed to distract us from an absolutely dismal performance from the Tories in terms of negotiating this Brexit. I think David Cameron had set himself against Europe and then tried to get a deal, which you can't do. And I think the Tories are now continuing in that mould, just forever stirring it up and not at all being able to get the kind of deal that will be good for British people. I think, you know, we are all very worried what on earth is going to happen to our economy. And whilst we've got to deal with people's um, concerns about security or, as I say, or pay, actually, we've got to make sure our economy doesn't fall off a cliff in the meantime. Rishi Sunak, I mean, this plan is pie in the sky, isn't it? I mean, it might be helpful for the government to talk tough on immigration in this way. But there's no chance of it being accepted as part of the EU negotiations, is there? Well, I think the first thing that's important to note is this isn't a government plan. This is a, you know, a draft of something that was written by civil servants that hasn't seen the light of day or indeed even been anywhere near the cabinet table. And I'm understood uh, that it's been revised six times since it was, this draft was written. But I think the important point is this. When we leave the European Union, we have a choice. Uh, do you want to continue with freedom of movement and stay inside the single market? Or do you want to leave it and be in control of our immigration policy? I think the broad thrust of the Conservative position is that we, we want to end free movement of people. Say, and then we have to replace that with an immigration policy well, that choice. does two simple things you know one is that it controls the amount of low-skill immigration into this country it doesn't stop it doesn't end it we don't put a wall up we're just in control of it but and at the same time we want to make sure we are open to the breasts and biters around you the world say we and, have and a attract choice. them here you say we have a choice but actually it will be dictated by what is acceptable by the rest of the eu I, I, I and they won't I, buy a plan well, I don't, like I don't, this. I don't, I, I, I don't accept that at all. The EU has signed free trade deals with South Korea. It's in the process of finalising one with Canada. Uh, neither of those free trade deals contain anything close to the free movement of people at all. They want to sign a free trade deal with Japan, we've recently learned. Again, immigration is not part of any of these free trade deals. And in fact, nowhere around the world do free trade deals remain conditional on a country saying, let's open our borders to you know, your country with absolutely no controls at all. That is a very uh, odd situation. Alison, to be in and trade and immigration are not linked issues but, anywhere Alison else. Alison McGovern? But none of this stacks up because Theresa May, when she was Home Secretary, controlled all the non-EU uh, immigration to this country and she did not choose to cut it at all. Why? Because the cost to our economy would be huge. So we have to decide to make a deal here. We have to step forward and say, OK, we need to do a deal with Europe that will keep our economy going and I think lots of people who voted leave did so on the basis that the terms of trade that our country would enjoy would be the same as before. So so none of this um, that the Tories are putting forward about um, imaginary trade deals that are not coming forward at all really stacks up and I think it's about time we stop with these games of leaking documents here and there to try and distract the British public and actually you know, the Tories have to step forward and say, what are they going to do to make a deal with the Europeans and to make sure that my constituents aren't losing their jobs in two years' time? Rishi yeah, I, think, I mean, I mean I think, what are you meant point. to make of all this? The fact that, you know, there is no clear strategy at the moment. Within Cabinet, we know that they are still arguing about what the immigration policy should be post-Brexit. No, I think actually we're in the process of in going into great detail on every aspect of our future relationship, both with the EU and internally what do we want our agricultural policy and our immigration policy and things like that to be. But this point that you know, no one is interested in signing a free trade deal with us, we just had Iceland say everyone wants to sign a free trade deal with you when you leave the UK. That's not me saying it, that's Iceland saying it. We've had positive noises from America, from Canada, from New Zealand, from Australia, from South Korea, from India. In fact, the rest of the world is ready and excited. We're the fifth largest economy in the world with a lot to offer. So I think actually Actually, there will be a very positive future for us outside of the EU when we get on to doing all these free trade deals. And in terms of working out the details of these policies about what we do Alison, when we leave the in. EU, we, we, we need to leave the EU. We need to leave the EU in order to from, actually from have Donald control Trump. of this.
those policies. At this point in time, I think I will keep my concern for my constituents' jobs and their welfare, quite honestly. You know, we were told by David Davis and others that by now we would have had secured deals and that, you know, all of this would be absolutely clear, and it isn't. And in fact, when it comes to making policy for the future of our country. The government this week is trying to rob Parliament of its powers to regulate industry and to set policy for this country and they're trying to um, just get Parliament to rubber stamp Alison, a massive transfer of powers Alison and that Gavin, is because they're insecure and they know they can't win the argument. Alison, Governor and Rishi Sunak, I'm sorry we're going to have to end it there but thank you very much. Thank you. Pattern. Hurricane Irma, with winds of 185 miles per hour, has slammed through the Caribbean with record ferocity, causing huge swathes of damage to the islands in its path. Rooftops and trees in St. Martin and St. Bart's were brought down, with electricity supplies cut off, plunging the islands into blackout. The U.S. National Hurricane Center has called the Category 5 hurricane potentially catastrophic, with emergency evacuations now in place from the Bahamas to Florida. Our Washington correspondent, Kylie Morris, reports. This is how Irma descended on the Leeward Islands. These terrifying images from tiny St. Martin. French overseas territory to the north, Dutch to the south, but Irma blurred all distinctions. The howling wind gusting up to 185 miles per hour, deafening and destructive. In Phillipsburg at the island's rent-a-car, Irma twisted sheet metal and crushed cars with debris. At the Beach Plaza Hotel, as the eye moved over the coast, there was a glimpse of a corridor awash and windblown. Two guests in their towels venturing down the stairs as the surf crashes into the levels below. Look at the hotel upstairs, mashed up. Oh my God, look, look. Check almost all the furniture in here. Inside their hotel room in Phillipsburg, and Kelly and Bill Kellett, tourists from the U.S., had moved their mattresses to block windows and taken cover in the bathroom. It's pretty bad. It's uh, the rain and the clouds are swirling. Whirling around outside. The wind is actually blowing through the front door around the cracks. Uh, lightning, thunder. Even as they show us around the room, and just before they're cut off, they notice there's water coming in. Oh, we're flooded. Yeah, we, uh, we actually now are flooded. In Gustavia, the capital of St. Bart's, seawater surged into the street, feet deep, as residents looked on from above. In its immensity, Irma represents a new category of extreme weather. She's a system so large she covers an area equivalent to the UK and Ireland. The eye of the storm fluctuates around 30 miles across. Some islands could actually be seen through it in their entirety. Data collected by a meteorological flight into the hurricane confirmed record-breaking winds with sustained speeds of more than 180 miles an hour. Irma sideswiped Antigua and Barbuda, where there was minimal damage. But now she's bearing down on the British and US Virgin Islands and Turks and Caicos, as well as Haiti and the southeastern Bahamas. This video of Irma's tempestuous approach to Tortola, the biggest of the British Virgin Islands. Diffitt says there's a naval ship in the region carrying 40 Royal Marines and Army engineers, shelter, water purification kits and vehicles. Irma is predicted to pass near or just north of Puerto Rico tonight, where the governor has urged residents to evacuate to shelters. In Washington, President Trump had his own observations. We'll see what happens. We'll know in a very short period of time, but it looks like it could be something that will be uh, not good. Believe me, not good. <laughs> Florida is already under a state of emergency with the National Guard deployed and residents stocking up with essential supplies. If it stays on course, Irma could make landfall in the U.S. this weekend.
Kylie Morris there. Well, our weather presenter, Liam Dutton, is here to explain more. Liam, just how powerful is this hurricane? Well, Jackie, it's an extremely dangerous and very powerful storm. This is the picture from space from today, around the last six hours or so. And you can see the huge mass of clouds spinning around with a very clearly defined central eye where, where the worst the, wind, the winds are. Now, this is a Category 5 storm. It's got sustained winds of 185 miles an hour, but it's got even stronger gusts, gusts in excess of 200 miles an hour. And obviously, when those kind of wind strengths hit small islands, they cause big areas of devastation. Because not just powerful, but big too. It is. That's the other thing about Hurricane Irma. It's a very big storm as well as being powerful. Now, what I've done here is I've drawn a yellow circle around the storm over the Caribbean, and we're going to shift the globe and take that same circle and lay it over our neck of the woods. And you get a sense of just how big that storm is. If it was over our part of the world, it would completely cover the UK and Ireland around five to 600 miles across. And of course, the big question is, where is it headed? Well, it's currently pummeling the uh, British Virgin Islands, as we heard in Kylie's report there. And in the next 24 hours, it's going to move west, northwestwards, further through the Caribbean, heading towards the Bahamas. That means through tonight and into tomorrow, it's going to affect Puerto Rico, northern parts of Cuba and Haiti, as well as the Dominican Republic, eventually working towards the Turks and Caicos Islands. And again, it's the same theme, damaging gusts of wind, torrential rain, flooding, a significant storm surge, and it may well reach into Florida this weekend. There's a bit of uncertainty about the exact path, but at the moment it does look like Florida may well be in the firing line. Liam, thank you very much. Fatima. Well, on the line with me now from Antigua is Gaston Brown, Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda. Mr Brown, thanks very much for joining us. First of all, you have experienced storms before, but this is something else, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, clearly a monster storm. And uh, we have successfully weathered what would have been the most powerful hurricane to storm its way through the Caribbean. And I would say that we would have done so with a stunning result. Now, it is true that um, Antigua did not get winds up to 185 miles per hour, but we had winds in excess of 120 miles per hour. In the case of our sister island, Barbuda, uh, Barbuda would have gotten up to 185 miles per hour. We are not sure of the full extent of the damage in Barbuda, but as at 4 a.m. this morning, we were told that a number of house roofs were actually lost and that there was some minimal infrastructural um, damage. But um, in Antigua, we see it very well. It shows very clearly that the infrastructure here in Antigua and Barbuda is resilient. And what is perhaps even more important is that there have been no fatalities because our people would have heeded the warnings and they would have treated this storm with absolute respect and seriousness. So consequently, we would have seen a reduction in the horrendous damage that was actually predicted. So for us, you know, being in an advanced state of uh, preparedness and readiness would have yielded significant dividends for the Twin Islands state of Antigua and Barbuda. And as you say, Mr. Brown, you have escaped the worst, but in St. Martin there is, flood, there is flooding and blackouts. Uh, what are you hearing from there? Yes, uh, so we're told, and um, we understand too, that um, the country's lonely and poor would have had some damage as well. It's very unfortunate, um, you know, we are islands that are dependent on tourism and whenever the infrastructure gets damaged in that way, the economic infrastructure, uh, it creates um, significant hardship for our country. So we're very sad to hear that um, they've had that level of devastation, but um, I'm equally happy though that the other countries within the Northern Caribbean but that would have been spared the wrath of um, Hurricane Irma, which clearly was a monster storm and a storm that could have brought far more devastation and destruction to the Caribbean. Gaston Brown, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Six new reports into the Rotherham child sexual exploitation scandal have blamed, blamed widespread systemic failure rather than any specific individuals, saying there was now little they could do to take action against former staff. The council commissioned the reviews after the J report revealed how at least 1,400 children were left at risk of sexual abuse. Many were raped, trafficked and exploited over a period of 16 years by gangs of men, mostly of Pakistani heritage. But with no one now held to account, Rotherham MP Sarah Champion called it a wasted opportunity to allow the town to move forward. Diana Magne reports. There has been so much talking done now in Rotherham. Whistleblowers who weren't heard, victims who've testified of the horrendous abuse they suffered, the authors of public inquiries, the Jay Report and the Casey Review, detailing what went wrong. But there is a piece in this jigsaw, accountability for senior managers at the council, that's still missing. 
It just seems to me that whenever it comes to the professional side of it, uh, people are just getting away with it, you know, they'll retire or there seems to be some kind of loophole. So I'd like to welcome everybody here this afternoon. Today's reports add to the catalogue of failings on the part of the council, but did not single out any individuals for blame. We looked hard at these. Often we found evidence that something had happened, but we could find no evidential basis to suggest that there was a planned or orchestrated cover-up. Put plainly, it was more cock-up than conspiracy. The report authors say it was hampered by the fact that 27 individuals failed to respond or refused to be interviewed, including a number of senior officers. Amongst them were former council leader Roger Stone, who resigned in the wake of the Jay report, his successor Paul Lakin, and former head of children's services Sean Wright, who went on to become the area police and crime commissioner. Wright is already under investigation by the police watchdog. In 2014, he told the Home Affairs Select Committee that he knew nothing about child sexual abuse in Rotherham when he was head of child services there. The IPCC are now looking into whether that was true. For decades, the sexual abuse of children went on in Rotherham unchecked. Gangs of men, the majority of whom were of Pakistani background, preyed on young, mostly white children. Girls as young as 11, groomed to believe they were the girlfriend of the perpetrator, gang raped, trafficked for sex to other northern towns and cities. 1,400 victims at a conservative estimate. Today's report once again points to systematic mistakes on the part of the council, but the senior leadership involved during the period of investigation have moved on or resigned, some of them retired with pensions. And the authors of today's report say they have no further recourse. A wasted opportunity, says Jane Senior, who has long campaigned on behalf of victims. I'm a little bit disappointed actually, I think it's a missed opportunity. I mean. You know, for the survivors, victims and families in Rotherham, they've waited 15, 20 years in some cases to get the answers to what went wrong in the past. And I'm shocked that nobody's been held accountable. Some have been held accountable. 21 of the perpetrators are now behind bars. Dozens of police officers are under investigation. And the council says it's a different organisation to what it was but for Rotherham's hundreds of victims, this is nowhere near enough. Well, earlier I spoke to the new leader of Rotherham Council, Chris Reid. I began by asking him why no senior figures from Rotherham Council will face criminal charges. I'm as frustrated as anybody is that the reports today don't manage to pin culpability or criminal culpability on any current or former members of staff. But of course, it's incredibly frustrating to see uh, no one who was here at the time, no one held responsible in that way. 27 people refused to be questioned by the authors of the report, including senior council officers and the former leader. They're a disgrace, aren't they? They are absolutely for refusing to take part in that way. These are people who had the chance to come forward to tell their side of the story, to help to shed some light on what went wrong in Rotherham and give some solace to children and their families who were so badly let down. And they chose not to do so. I hope they can live with their consciences. But what about the fact that these people couldn't be compelled? That in effect these reports that have been done on behalf of your council offer nothing to these young women and girls? Well, I, I hope they don't offer nothing. I hope they do help to cast some light on the failings at the council. And I really do hope that survivors and their families can take some solace. In a sense, we know and have known for some time what the failings were. What these young women and girls and victims of the abuse were after was justice. And they're not going to get it, are they? Well, I think it's important to remember that there are ongoing criminal investigations. The National Crime Agency is undertaking the biggest ever inquiry into child sexual exploitation in Britain, looking at these uh, non-recent events in Rotherham. So I'm still hopeful that as part of that, um, people will see justice, including potentially uh, prosecutions of public servants where failings are found to be that severe. But Unfortunately, these reports today were 
let me just finish about these reports today if I can. These reports today were uh, commissioned by the council. They do depend on volunteers coming forward to take, uh, to take part in them and we can't compel people to do so. But where is the value in those reports then if people, key people, refuse to give evidence? One of the victims stood up at the end of the meeting and said, what is the point in all the money that's been spent on this, these reports if no one is brought to justice? And she's got a point, hasn't she? She does have a point and I absolutely understand uh, the sentiment and I share that sentiment. But let me put it another way to you. In the immediate aftermath of the Jay report, the then Chief Executive of the Council declared very quickly that no one could be held responsible for the failings revealed in that report. That wasn't an acceptable answer then and it's not an acceptable answer to me now. My predecessor as leader therefore commissioned these reports and therefore we have to let that work be done, we have to share that information and I think we'd be facing a very different criticism if we hadn't done what we've done today. But do you accept for many of the victims these reports have been a waste of time and money? Well I really hope they haven't been a waste of time and money but of course I understand that people may feel like that. I hope they help to shed some more light on what went wrong in Rotherham. They do name individuals, they do name former members of senior staff. I think some of those people are going to come under a lot of pressure now um, but of course I understand people's frustration and I absolutely share it. And um, can you be sure that the errors of judgment, the missed opportunities that are peppered through these reports, that that era is genuinely over? Are you confident that grooming has now disappeared from your area? Well, let me answer that question in two parts. I'm very confident that the council today is a very different place to where it was four years or more ago. There are new people in place and they have been under enormous scrutiny. We've had uh, the biggest ever government intervention in Rotherham reporting back to government every three months for the last three years. Um, so I'm very confident that we've made big changes, big strides in the right direction and our child protection is better. On the second part of your question, I'm afraid there will always be people who want to hurt children, not just in Rotherham, but elsewhere. We have a national epidemic of child abuse in our country. So we still face a, a threat from people who want to hurt children. What I can tell you is our services are better, we're helping to keep children safe better, and we're much more robust in coming after these vile criminals whenever we can. Now, police in East London have launched a murder investigation over the death of a 14-year-old boy who was shot in the back of the head at point-blank range, calling it an extreme act of violence. Officers found Corey Jr. Davis and a 17-year-old boy suffering from gunshot wounds just after 3 o'clock yesterday afternoon in Forest Gate, East London. Police have appealed for help to trace a 4x4 vehicle seen leaving the scene. Simeon Brown has this report. Most 14-year-olds are returning to school this week, but Corey Jr. Davis will not be one of them. Last night, the teenager was declared dead following an incident the afternoon earlier. On Monday afternoon, officers were called to more walk in Forest Gate, near Corey's home following reports of a shooting. When they arrived on the scene, they found 14-year-old Corey and an older 17-year-old boy with gunshot injuries. Corey would not survive. The older boy is now stable, but has life-changing injuries. The police have opened a murder investigation and have appealed for witnesses. The worry is that the shocking killing of a child is part of a growing wave. 19-year-old Abdul Mayanja was shot dead on the 25th of August in nearby Stratford. Two men have since been arrested on suspicion of murdering the young RAF cadet. That shooting followed a severe incident in East London just the day before when two men, both aged 21, were injured when a shotgun was fired. Then on Saturday, August 26th, two teenagers, both 19, were shot, one in the foot and the other in his shoulder. Five young people shot across three days is an epidemic and gun violence in the capital had risen by 42% in the last year. Speaking yesterday, the Met said they've increased their presence. There is a feud between some gangs on, on the borough, so, so I would say yes. Uh, but, but I must say, particularly in the relation to the, the incident last night, we're keeping an open mind in relation to that particular one. But in relation to the ones before that, we, we, there was some link between a feud between gangs on the borough. The police are appealing for information about a light-coloured 4x4 vehicle seen leaving the area. But so far, no arrests have been made for the senseless killing of a young boy in broad daylight.
Simeon Brown. Now, thousands of journalists have joined protests across India after a prominent newspaper editor was shot dead outside her home in Bangalore. Gauri Lankesh was gunned down yesterday by attackers riding a motorbike in what's being seen as an attempt to silence critics of the ruling Hindu Nationalist Party. Protesters vowed to continue her fight against what they called haters of free speech. The United Nations investigation says it's found evidence that Syrian government forces carried out a sarin gas attack in Idlib province in April, which left at least 83 civilians dead. Syria has denied responsibility. The Commission of Inquiry also called on the US-led coalition to better protect civilians as it attacks militant Islamic State forces in the east. Five men charged after an investigation into the Hillsborough disaster appeared at a pre-trial hearing in Preston today. The five include ex-South Yorkshire Chief Constable Sir Norman Bettison, seen on the left here, and former Sheffield Wednesday Club Secretary Graham Mackerel on the left in this picture. No formal pleas were entered during the hearing. Well, back now to our main news tonight, those leaked documents revealing government plans for a tough new immigration regime after Brexit. All but the most highly skilled EU workers would only be allowed to stay for two years, with possible quotas to follow. The proposals, which haven't yet been officially approved, are already alarming business groups who've described them as catastrophic. And there's also been an angry reaction to Downing Street's effort to get Britain's biggest businesses to swing behind their Brexit strategy. Across fields and farms, restaurants and pubs, British businesses have got used to an easy flow of European workers and argue that this flexible labour force helps them grow. But the government knows many voted for Brexit because they were concerned by the levels of immigration, particularly from Eastern Europe. There are now 2.2 million EU nationals working in the UK labour market. That's 7% of the total. 9% of retail and leisure workers are from the EU. It's the same share in construction and a little higher in manufacturing. So the government wants to discourage EU workers coming into the country while pushing UK companies to fill their jobs with local workers. There are currently more than three quarters of a million vacancies. But with the employment rate at its highest since records began and unemployment at its lowest since 1975, some companies may wonder where these local workers are going to come from. Well, earlier I spoke to Fraser Nelson, Spectator Editor, and Nadra Ahmed, who used to run care homes and is now the Executive Chairman of the National Care Association. And I began by asking her what she thought of today's proposals. Well, I think we have to understand that um, the social care sector, health and social care, um, are already challenged about the recruitment and retention of um, care staff. Something like this will further destabilise it. We've got to really be clear that we will be looking for another one million workers over the next five years in order to meet the demographics of older people. And for some reason, over the last decade and a half, we've not been able to encourage um, people from within the UK to take those roles on. And so we've been heavily reliant on workers from abroad. And so in, our, in order to fulfil that, we must be very, very careful about the messages we're currently sending out. OK, Fraser Nelson, you say that the shortage of workers could actually be a good thing. Why? Well, in some respects, I mean, in the last um, sort of 10, 12 years, employers have rapidly availed themselves of, of EU labour. It's been brilliant for employers, lots of very highly dedicated, industrious and not terribly expensive people coming in to help companies grow. Now, this has been great from many um, perspectives, but one of the side effects is that you have to ask, have British people been trained as much as they might otherwise be? The incentive to train them isn't as high if you can get fully trained people from abroad. If you look at British salaries as well. They've been stagnant for quite some time now. And certainly you hear the care sector, other sectors say that if immigration is going to drop, then their, their wage pressures might increase. Now, that is true. Prices might go up. But you also have to ask, is it such a bad thing if wage pressures increase? Is it such a bad thing if employers have to go to extra lengths to recruit, to entice, and even to train the people for the kind of jobs that they need? Okay, Nadra Ahmed, why don't you just recruit British workers and pay them more? 
If you look at the job um, vacancies, in any job centre you will see social care jobs being advertised on a regular basis. We just do not get people coming forward. The image of social care has been so damaged in this country that we are not finding people readily available to come and even give it a chance. So we are trying that. You know, going abroad and recruiting staff is not the first port of call. It is usually done when we cannot get people to fill the jobs. And of course, by regulatory uh, requirements, we are required to have a certain number of staff within our uh, establishments to meet the needs of the vulnerable people. Quite rightly so. Fraser Nelson, there are no British people to do these jobs. You've just heard there someone from the care sector saying they are not queuing up to become care workers. Where are we going to find all these people? Well, there's a little bit missing there. Perhaps they're not queuing up to become care workers at the salaries being offered. Perhaps those salaries, which are not exactly famously high in the health and social care sector, ought to be a bit better. I can't think of any important, more important resource in, uh, in health and social care than the people who are around looking after the sick and the infirm. Surely that ought to be where you put most of your investment. Now, the thing is that there is a skills shortage in Britain in general. The employment is um, doing pretty well. But wages have not gone up. This is a huge problem in our economy. And as if employers are saying it's outrageous that they might even have to consider putting up wages a bit more, paying when they're struggling to find people, struggling to fill jobs. I'm not so sure it's such a bad thing. Nadra Ahmed, you were shaking your head there, what Fraser Nelson was saying. I just think it's maybe we're living in parallel universes because actually when we look at the social care sector and we, we've looked at the last general election, the manifestos, the challenges that were faced, it has been clearly evidence that social care is not being funded properly. We are paying what is the national living wage. The vast majority of providers are paying more than that in order to get the staff that they um, uh, that they want and over and above that we are training them we're trying to recruit them they do not stay in the role for very long because it is a very challenging and stressful role it is a skilled role now we are delivering health care needs now we are looking after people who are dying we are looking after people with strokes parkinson's all those conditions which people think are health conditions but they're actually in our services and yet we're not being funded to do that and nobody wants to tackle that issue. It's very easy to blame the sector for not paying um, a, 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 a wage that people feel that they ought to. Providers themselves want to be paying that. When I was a provider I wanted to be paying much more than I was paying. I think you need to go and look at the evidence sir. So Fraser Nelson, isn't it the case that you are not listening to evidence from employers from those in these sectors because you and perhaps indeed the government are obsessed with this jingoistic mantra of British jobs for British workers? Well, I'm not obsessed with it. I'm quite a liberal on uh, immigration and nobody's saying we're going to be fewer immigrants. We're going to get tens of thousands more immigrants every single year and the economy needs them. Um, I don't see, I don't think anybody is really contesting that, uh, but I do look at something else other than the cries of employers. I look at the way that wages in this country have been stagnant for a decade. That is a really, really big problem here. And if it's the case that employers are having to pay more, then that is the solution to the way we've got to one of the biggest problems in our society right now is wages that are far too low. I mean, I, I can imagine the job of a care worker. It's incredibly difficult. Well, one of my cousins is a care worker. And I have to tell you, he doesn't get paid anywhere near enough for the incredibly hard work that he does. So I think if you Humans are becoming a lot more scarce. I think that's a good thing because it's time to pay the humans a bit more. But Fraser Nelson, this is not about multinationals. This is about public sector workers. And in the end, if you're calling for higher wages, it's taxpayers who are going to pick up the bill. Yes, and perhaps taxpayers and consumers should pick up the bill for higher wages. If we have a skilled workforce that's capable of doing more, that's how economies are supposed to function. And I think that a focus on the skills gap, a focus on people, is long overdue after a decade of stagnant wages. We'll have to leave it there. Fraser Nelson and Nazra Ahmed, thank you both very much. A police disciplinary hearing has heard how three officers failed in their duty of care to a man who lay dying in the caged rear of a police van. Adrian McDonald's last words were, I can't breathe, but an expert's evidence said it took nine minutes before police attempted to resuscitate him. The officers all deny the charges. It's the latest case this week to highlight concerns over deaths in police custody. 
Our senior home affairs correspondent Simon Israel reports. Adrian McDonald's mother and brother have waited nearly three years to find out why. A 34-year-old son went to a party three days before Christmas in 2014, took cocaine and ended up dead of a heart attack in the caged rear of a police van. Behind those bare facts lies a police response now under scrutiny and a family search for answers. Adrian was the one that kept us all together because he was the one that was always on his mobile calling everybody to make sure everybody were alright. He's missed a lot. He's missed a lot. Basically he's devastated the whole family. We're devastated. We'll never get over it. Today the family arrived for the opening of a gross misconduct hearing of three Staffordshire police officers involved on that fateful night. The tears came as they struggled to watch footage from a police body-worn camera that showed Adrian dying six minutes after being placed in the cage. His last words were, I can't breathe. The hearing was told how police were called to this block in Stoke with news a man had barricaded himself in one of these flats, wide-eyed, disturbed and hearing voices. Eventually, the 34-year-old father was restrained after being repeatedly bitten by a police dog and tasered unsuccessfully four times. The death of Adrian MacDonald has had little media coverage. There have been no public demonstrations or protests. His mother and brother have maintained a dignified silence. Yet they've had to wait nearly three years for an explanation. The issue facing these officers, Sergeant Jason Bromley at the front, Inspector Richard Bills following and PC John Tench at the back, is not whether they could have saved Mr MacDonald's life, but whether they delayed summoning medical help. PC Tench told the hearing, Mr MacDonald's last gasp, I can't breathe, he suspected may have been a ruse to get him to open the doors so he could escape. And he didn't believe there was a medical emergency. Evidence from an A&E consultant found there was a nine minute delay from when the 34 year old slumped unconscious in the back of the van and resuscitation began. A delay he described as inappropriate. The constable said he was sorry but that he had done his best. But you can just see how proud he is of his kids there. It's not the case the alleged police failures would have saved Mr MacDonald's life. But his family's interests lie in the accusation made at the hearing that all three officers failed in their duty of care. That they should have acted quicker when realising he was a particularly vulnerable detainee. And that above all, the priority should have been to get him medically assessed. The nature of these alleged failings, the hearing was told, are sufficiently serious to justify dismissal. All three officers deny the misconduct charges. Simon Israel reporting. After the break, her, firm, her films take billions of pounds at box offices around the world. We spend all our time here. I want to make a paradise. We speak to the Hunger Games star Jennifer Lawrence about her controversial new film, yes. Mother, and Hollywood's gender pay gap. Hello. Welcome back. As disquieting as it is showy, the new film starring Jennifer Lawrence divided the critics when it premiered at the Venice Film Festival this week. Many unsettled by the psychological horror story of a woman trapped in a vortex of paranoid reality. But whatever the immediate reaction to Mother, 27-year-old Lawrence is enjoying a stellar career as one of the highest paid and most successful actresses on the planet. I went to talk to her this afternoon. We spend all our time here. I want to make a paradise. She redid all of that. Every last detail. Well, she breathed life back into every room. Are you happy? It is an extraordinary film in the truest sense of the word. Well, thank you. And I mean this in a very polite way. It's quite a stressful film to watch. Isn't yes, it? it's really hard to watch. It feels like an assault. I just saw it last night. I came out like, what have we done? <laughs> How have we done? What have we unleashed? Um, you know, it's 
it's it's hard when you're watching it and and then afterwards because I just had the experience and then when you go home and you kind of think about it and you have a moment you realize that you're just left with with feelings it's it's such a visceral reaction I mean you talked about you know this was an intense film to make you know what how did you sort of get a release from that intensity on set I had a Kardashian tent um, I had a tent that had the Kardashians playing 24-7 and a teddy bear and uh, gumballs. <laughs> and how did the Kardashians help? Um, well, they didn't end up, I ended up thinking that I would need this getaway for this one particular scene, but then I ended up um, hyperventilating and uh, passing out and then popping out or, or ripping my diaphragm. So then I, I spent more time actually in the medical tent than the Kardashian tent. I mean, that's an extraordinary physical reaction yeah. to what you were doing. Yeah, I've never, I've never had to go that far, and I was scared. You know, a couple of days before, I was starting to get really worried about um, going that, that far, because any woman, I mean, I don't want to give anything away from the movie, but anybody watching that, that film, nobody should feel, you know, what, what my character has to feel, so I was really worried about. Why don't you want kids? Excuse me? I mean, one of the themes is this sort of invasion of the woman's privacy. You know, there was one sort of invasion of your personal information that was quite useful, I'm assuming, when the hack re revealed the fact that you were paid less than your male co-stars. That's a massive issue for us at the moment. Why did you decide to speak out about it? Because, you know, I, I'm, I'm so fortunate to have my job. You know, my, my, my problem is not... Is not money. I, I wasn't upset that I, you know, only got this many millions for a movie. That's ridiculous. Um, but it, it, my, um, I was angry about, about the unfairness and, and equality. And, you know, it's not, it's not just in the movie industry. It's, you know, there's a 21% pay difference between men and women in America in all fields, in almost all fields. So um, I felt like I had a voice. People look at me and listen to me and to not use it, to not say anything, I, that's never really sat well with me. And it's interesting anyway, for, for someone like you who is so successful and with that comes a lot of power and yet you were still being paid less. Yeah, that's, it's, it's unfair, you know, I feel, like the gap, I feel like the gap slowly is closing, I feel like the, the more conversations we're having, the more progress is being made very slowly. Um, but yeah, it was, it was unfair. What do you think it's about? It's a big discussion ongoing here at the moment. What is it, do you think it's about? Is it that bosses, mainly men, like the idea of paying other men more? Is it an instinctive thing? Is it about how well, women think, approach I, it? I don't think it's one thing. I mean, I think, you know, on the one hand, if you can get away with paying somebody less, then do it. You know, a lot of people just don't choose the moral high road and say, no, that's not fair. Um, and I don't know, or you could go philosophical and say, why are we so afraid of women? <laughs> and it might be that. Why think. are we so terrified of these beings who produce life? I mean, when the director was asked about the film, why it was so dark, he said, it's a mad time to be alive. And there's certainly a sort of end of days feeling about it. There are many people in America who would say, you know, perhaps it's truer there at the moment than anywhere else. It's scary. Um, you know, it, it's this new language that's forming. It's, I, I don't even recognize it. It's also scary to know uh, that climate change is due to human activity and we continue to ignore it. And the only voice that we really have is through voting. Um, so and you have voted very a, recently and as a voted, country. And it was really startling. Um, you know, you're watching these hurricanes now and it's really, it's hard, especially while promoting this movie, not to, not to feel Mother Nature's rage, wrath. And it's not just about climate change though, is it, in America? I mean, it's, it seems to be a time of huge division. Yeah, it's, it's really polarizing and upsetting. You know, I've, I've, I've heard things and seen things on TV in my own country that devastate me and make me sick and um, it's just really confusing. Do you find President Trump confusing? I don't find him confusing. I, 
I think I know exactly what he is. And so how do you feel about the future? I have to feel hope. You know, you have to feel hope. You can't just fall into despair. But a producer on the movie called this film an impotent howl of rage. You know, it's just, it's like a helpless howl to the moon. It, like, it just, it, and it's an assault. Jennifer Lawrence there. Tonight's main news. Businesses have expressed their alarm over leaked government proposals to curb immigration of lower skilled EU workers after Brexit. Theresa May insisted the British people wanted control of immigration, but many business leaders say the impact of the new plans could be catastrophic. And heavy rain and 185 mile an hour winds have now begun battering the Virgin Islands and the coast of Puerto Rico as the powerful Hurricane Irma continues tearing through the Caribbean. Puerto Rico's governor warned tonight that the dangerousness of the storm was like nothing we've ever seen. That's all we've got time for tonight. That's Channel 4 News. We're back at 7 tomorrow. Until then, have a very good evening. Good evening. Make the most of any weather. Live life in the clear. Channel 4 Weather, sponsored by Crizal Lenses. Good evening. Well, the weather's looking fairly unsettled for the next couple of days. That means we'll all see some rain at some stage. It's also going to be breezy and feel distinctly cool for this time of the year. Now, here's the big picture at the moment. A low pressure sitting to the northwest of the UK. That's keeping the weather mixed. And around that area of low pressure, there's a brisk and cool wind blowing in off the Atlantic. Now, through this evening and overnight, for most of us, it's a cloudy story. There'll be a few showers around as well. But later in the night, the rain will turn a little bit more persistent towards the northwest of Scotland into Northern Ireland as well. Some heavy bursts mixed in with the breeze picking up. But for many of us, temperatures in double figures. But for northeast Scotland, locally dipping down to nine degrees. So tomorrow then, it's a cloudy, wet start to the day for Scotland and Northern Ireland, and that rain will sink southwards through the day, eventually reaching into Northern England as well as Wales, some heavy bursts mixed in too. But for the rest of us, it's mostly cloudy, but no more than the odd scattered shower here and there. Here's the picture then in more detail. This is four in the afternoon and it's still raining steadily at this stage of the day for Northern Ireland, so a wet evening commutes here, fairly breezy as well. Then for Scotland, the heaviest rain towards the western side of the country, the rain a little bit more hit and miss the further east that you happen to be. Temperatures were disappointing for this time of year, 15 or 16 in the north, 20 Celsius in the south if you're lucky. Now on Friday, low pressure will be spinning around just to the northeast of Scotland. There'll be a brisk, blustery, gusty northwesterly wind. That'll drive showers or longer spells of rain southwards through the day. And it really will feel cool with a top temperature of 17 or 18 degrees. Well, that's it from me. Enjoy your evening. Take care. Goodbye. Make the most of any weather. Live life in the clear. Channel 4 Weather, sponsored by Crizal Lenses.